see AI intersecting with blockchain technology? Um, are there any specific applications or concerns that come to your mind? Well, I think when the Skynet robots start shooting at all of us, we'll use the blockchain to buy the things we need to defend ourselves from the AI robots. That's a great use case. <laughs> I'm going to write about that. <laughs> no, seriously, though, there's a lot of different AI related. First of all, I'll just give you my broad take on AI, which is that it is going to be a big deal. I'm not one of the doom and gloom people. I don't think we need to forget about everything else and focus on preventing AI robots from killing us or something. I, I do think there are threats with the tech. Any new technology is going to have threats. I don't think this is on the scale of like the threat of nuclear war or you know, biological weapons, but I do think it is a technology that does present present um, legitimate threats. One of the examples of a threat, and then I'll talk about the good stuff, but one, other, one example of a threat is the prospect of deep fakes. I think we're probably only a couple of years away from it being within the budget of any, like, any evil genius who's got a million dollars to be able to produce hundreds of concurrent live streams of an event that's not happening. And so you could imagine a situation where maybe five years from now, someone on a million dollar budget can create dozens and dozens of live streams of a terrorist attack in London that is not actually happening. And meanwhile, like everybody else is, you know, like, I got, here I am in London, there's no terrorist attack, what are you talking about? And we might have a very difficult time figuring out which is real and which, and which is the fake. Um, and that's a situation where, that we could really be in. And it's kind of funny, about at least 20 years ago, I was asked a very similar question about, a, about, um, about fakes. Um, at a very, very different conference than this one, as you, mi as you might imagine. Um, and, I, and I said that like, democracy allows people to have differences of opinion, but generally f assumes that they can agree on facts. Like, if you're going to have an election, we have to agree on who the candidates are. When is election day? You know, like these basic things. We should be able, we should be able to agree on who the current leadership is, right? Like these are basic facts that we should be able to agree on as the sort of base from which we can have our differences of opinion. If we can't do that, it's hard to imagine how you can have a functional democracy. In the United States, the example I gave I was in the United States at the time is I gave an example of an election where we might not even be able to agree on who the current president is. And it turns out to be very prophetic because if you know what's going on in U.S. politics right now, like, there is, a, there, is one, there is a significant group of people who are saying we can't trust the results of the election, and there's another significant group of people saying there's absolutely no reason to say, like there's no basis in fact for that claim. And this is a, you know, a very basic factual, the kind of thing that should not be under, in dispute. And AI is going to make those types of disputes much more, diff, much, more, much more common and much more difficult to address. It's going to make it much more easily for people who want to create those types of, that type of confusion to do so. And that's also going to mean it's going to be harder to hold people to account. Let's say I do some terrible thing and there's video evidence and there's pictures and like you've got all the evidence that you would have needed, you know, 40, 30, 20 years ago to be absolutely certain I had done this terror. I don't know, maybe I shoot somebody and like there's a video of me holding the gun and right? I can claim that's a deep fake. And there's a problem in that it, how plausible is that claim and how can you know whether I'm, I'm telling the truth or not? And that's going to leave us in a situation where it's going to be very hard to hold people accountable and it's going to put pressure on things like our justice systems. You know, it used to be that forensic evidence wasn't a thing. Like all you had was, you had eyewitnesses or you couldn't tell who did something. Today, we have lots of forensic evidence. We have things like, D we have things like DNA and um, bullet matching, matching a bullet to a gun. And there have been some abuses. I don't know how many of you know about some of the stories of abuses of people who claimed that they could match bite marks to teeth when they couldn't, people who claimed that they could prove that fires were arson when it was just complete, like pseudoscience. We're going to have another wave of that, but it's not going to be pseudoscience. It's going to be the ability to falsify evidence. It's going to be so easy to falsify evidence so conclusively. And then, of course, we're going to have people who are going to attack legitimate evidence on the grounds that we can't tell that it's not falsified. The only way I see blockchain helping much with that is at least blockchain can prevent you from reconstructing the past. So blockchain can't prevent me from making a false claim now, but it can prevent me from making a false claim about something that happened in the past because we, can, we may be able to use it to date things more accurately. So if there's some legitimate footage from a certain date, it could be time stamped through a blockchain and that could make it harder for me to sort of reconstruct the past and claim that some footage I'm showing you now was something that happened in the past. Uh, that's a small victory but it's a victory. So from the doom and gloom to the good stuff, um, some of the potential for AI, um, 
AI image generation has come an incredible, I don't know if any of you guys saw my tweet, but I had a tweet where I showed what AI image generation looked like just one year ago and what it looks like today. And the difference is just astounding. It's just astronomical. And uh, it was, but not nearly as important as what things like ChatGPT and large language models have been able to do. It's, and that's a very dangerous technology because um, they have no conception of morality or truth. They have, they, what they try to do is they try to give you the answer they think you want. And they're very good at giving you what you think you want, which has little to do with whether it's truthful or accurate in many domains. I'm sure many of you have seen, I tweeted about it, the lawyers who cited cases that did not exist because AI uh, created those cases. Because typically when you answer a legal question, you cite cases and people want you to cite cases. So it cited cases. It didn't know that it was important that you cite cases that in fact exist. It had no idea that that was kind of a very important thing in the law, which it is very, very important thing in law. These lawyers are very lucky that they didn't get this far, but we're going to see a lot more of that. We're going to see a lot more of reliance on AI without people understanding the limitations of AI. The other thing is that AI cannot, like, it can't be racist or biased in the way you and I ordinarily understand those terms, but it can create the exact same effect. It can do the same thing a racist person would do. So like a racist person might look at job candidates and discriminate on the basis of race and like not prefer the candidates who are the race that they don't, that they don't like. And we can, we can make an AI, like we can just not tell it race. And so in theory, it can't do that. But what winds up happening is it winds up preferring candidates who have um, like in their background, they have things like their name is Chad, which like, let's be honest, that's a proxy for gender and race. Like, there's no reason to prefer people named Chad. There's no rational reason. But the AI isn't doing it because the AI is racist or misogynist or something. The AI is saying, well, you hired people named Chad in the past and they were successful. And whether and that may be because you had biased practice, that may be because of biased human practices, but it will, it will carry through those biases because the biases are inherent in the data. If you ask it to draw a woman, you'll probably get like a young white woman because most of the training, that's what like a lot of the training data consists of. And if you want someone from another race, you have to tell it that. So it's sort of like the default is whatever is dominant in its input data. And what's dominant in its input data can carry forward human biases. And that's a huge problem that can happen without us ever intending to do it. And the biggest problem is AI is, most AIs are black boxes. ChatGPT cannot tell you why it gave you a particular answer. So if it gives you, if it gives you an answer like, hey, this person shouldn't be on probation, they're likely to reoffend. it can't tell you why it said that. It can't, it can't enumerate what factors it used. So if it used the fact that that person's name wasn't Chad, it can't tell you that. And so it's very difficult to see how the biases in the input data make it through into the output data. I don't know if blockchain is going to be able to help with any of those things, but I know that those are going to be real problems that, like, that, we're, that we're going to have to tangle with. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, really insightful. What are your thoughts on AI chatbots for developers to write software faster or just like easier? I think, I think I had a conversation, well, I did have a conversation yesterday about someone, someone at RippleX was mentioning that. Um, do you have any thoughts on AI being used for that? I think it's a. I think it's a. It's a fantastic time saver. Um, you, you do have to be very careful. You do have to be very careful with it. Um, but it is. It is a great time saver. There are a number of similar tools like framework. Like frameworks that don't use AI. But this is sort of like um, a turbocharged. A turbocharged version of that. That may. That may also sort of democratize the ability to code. We've. Um, there's been a lot of, there's a lot of gatekeeping in coding. Like if you want to write code like in the XRP Ledger software itself, the cost of admission is very high. <laughs> like the, the knowledge base that you need in order to do that just without breaking something is extraordinarily high. And anything that we can do to sort of reduce that barrier to entry is going to be a really good thing. AI is one of the technologies that does seem to be um, improving that quite a bit. I have not messed with it myself yet. Um, so I can't tell you what, like, what the first-hand experience is, is like, but I've seen people who wanted to write a game in a particular framework, and they told the AI just the most basic parameters of the game, and they actually had a functional working game, like a couple of iterations, like, oh, you, you didn't understand what I meant by this, but a very like, conversational interaction, and then they had a working game. They had all the framework, and then they could you know, change the places where they wanted things that were really different. But that's, that's a pretty significant time to I can tell you, as a programmer, 
a lot of time is spent in boilerplate. A lot of time is spent in just, you know, like, I want a class that does these things and has these members and I need, you know, and it's just a lot of time just turning that into code before you actually get to do the sort of creative part. And any, anything, that, anything that can streamline that is going to be fantastic. And we'll see how that goes. But I mean, if you look at where AI has come in just two years, I don't see any reason that's going to slow down. You know, some technologies, you see these revolutions and then they sort of slow down. And so then if they don't have the impact that you might have thought. But I don't see, I don't see this slowing down. I think we're going to continue to... Uh, it turn, it, I guess the thing that's frightening to me is the algorithms that ChatGPT uses are really dumb. Like if, you, if I explain them in detail, you'd be like, seriously, that's what ChatGPT is doing? That doesn't sound like that should be able to produce anything. Like we thought that like if you wanted to create something that could do the kinds of things that ChatGPT could do, you'd have to do them more or less the way a human brain works. You'd have to sort of like implement general intelligence. And it turns out that you can, you can fake a very significant fraction of what we think of as intelligence in these, these <coughs> I hate to say it, but they're shockingly dumb. They're, they're, they're basically just pattern matching. They basically find patterns in the input and replicate them in the output by giving the output that tends to match the types of inputs. Like, we don't think of that as intelligence. We think of that as just like very simple number crunching. And it's a little frightening to think that what we think of as the outputs of intelligence may be easily produced with algorithms that don't seem very intelligent to us. Um, I don't know where I was going with that, but I hope you <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, because I think a lot of people think AI has all the answers. But like you said, I agree. It's a time saver. You know, I, I'm not going to use it for writing because I'm a very good writer and I don't need help with that. But maybe someone who's not a good writer may want to use an AI you know, tool to help them save time to write a paragraph or whatever. That I have used ChatGPT for, and it's yeah. been tremendously helpful. Okay. I'm, I'm super awkward with certain types of things like certain types of responses to people, like, like when a project doesn't go well and you have to tell the team, hey, I understand you guys you know, did what you needed, you tried your best and you know, failed through no fault of your own. Like if you go to a chat GPT and you say, I need to send a message to a team that worked really hard on a project but failed due to external events they had no control over and I want to you know, motivate them to keep at it and express sympathy, how should I do that? And he'll give you a, he'll do a phenomenally good job of giving you a, a letter. Or if you say like, you know, I invited my best friend to my wedding but my fiance hates him, how do I tell him he's not invited without hurting his feelings? Like, I don't know how to do that, but ChatGPT is fantastic. <laughs> You know, ChatGPT is actually fantastic at that kind of thing. <laughs> Seriously, like, give it a try. Cases. Yeah, no, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing, David. It's better at emotions than I am. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's no, crazy. No, but in fairness, though, what it's doing is there's a lot of emotional content in its input, and it's sort of mining that and spitting it back out. It is not, you know, it, it, it handles emotions the same way like Mark Zuckerberg does. Yeah, you, you know, interestingly enough, um, I had to write a creative piece one time, and because I'm not a creative writer, I used to be, but now I'm just very straightforward. I, I actually did ask ChatGPT for help, and it was very emotional and creative. Yeah, it seemed so, like it, right? Yeah, it was much more emotional and creative than I am. But what it's doing, though, is that it is, it is, I mean, in a literal sense, it's not emotional or creative. What it's doing is there's a tremendous amount of emotional and creative input and the funny thing is, is like we think of being creative as finding things that are not in the input, right? Like if you're just regurgitating the input, that's not creative. But it turns out that a very significant fraction of what we describe as creative is just re is, is rearranging input. And the proof of that is that you can give ChatGPT a question and it can produce an output that seems cre that honestly seems creative. Yeah. And and so it. It's a little frightening to think like when we're creative, are we just, you know, reorganizing input the same, you know, I think we solve problems very differently from the way AI does. It's just shocking that the things that we thought that you needed, the sort of emotion and commitment to truth and all those, those sort of things that we value in people that we interact with, that we thought you needed to produce those types of outputs, you can produce those outputs without having those things. Right. That's, that's yeah. scary. Yeah, it's crazy. Okay, let's talk about tokenization. Um, the concept of tokenization has grown beyond just cryptocurrency. Assets, rights, and even identities are getting tokenized today. So how do you envision the broader role of tokenization in reshaping finance, and where does XRPL fit into the narrative? 
Yeah, there's been a lot of interest recently in real-world asset tokenization, you know, from, even from outside the crypto space, from traditional finance. I think people are starting to realize that there's a lot of friction in the transfer of certain types of value. I, real estate is like the best example of, of, a, of a, an area where there's high friction. And some of that friction is inherent. If I'm buying a piece of real estate, like I have to check it out.